You are now checking out The Win Podcast Where the everyday people Are the celebrities So, so let's, let's get, get to, to know them, them. Well, okay, so I'm Julissa Yvette Contreras mm-hmm. um, I was technically born in Harlem But I was raised in the Bronx. So when uh, I turned one, literally like the day after my first birthday, my parents packed up. Uh, We grew up, we were at Riverside and 135th. And then there were too many rats. The the rent was high. And now if you go back to that area, like those are luxury apartments. And like there's no way we could afford ever living in those same apartments. Um, The rats are looking at you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, now they have bougie rats, right? (laughs) Um, And so, but I grew up in the Bronx. Bronx, uh, in Morrison Soundview area. Um, and at first growing up, I thought I was going to be a politician. I used to say I was going to be mayor of New York city. That was my goal. I was like a nerd to the fullest degree. I was always on debate teams and presidents of clubs and all that stuff. Um, and I would piss the principal off a lot because I was always up his ass about not having the right books or, um, if I didn't feel teachers were fair, like I just always had something to yap about. When, when did that start for you? Like this, this fire to like, I'm going to speak up. I don't know. And was that taught? I was going to say, I don't know where I got this entitlement from because my parents are very good, calm people. And I just have always had a mouth on me. I think that seeing my family, I had come from a very wholesome family. You know, they're very Christian and all that jazz. But I grew up in a two fam- like a two parent home. Mm-hmm. And so everything was like really picture perfect. And I think the older I started getting in school and realizing that my life was not the life of all my peers around me, that not everybody had both parents and not everybody was growing up in wholesome environments mm-hmm. and that there were a lot of things that my parents were shielding me from um, that were there, like in their head, it's like, oh, stay away from El Tigeraje and all that stuff. But in reality, like what that world was and the reasons why they, they had to shield me from anything at all, like as a kid, I already knew that it wasn't my community's fault that they behaved or were in the circumstances that they were in. And I just felt like it was, I needed people to see that. Right. And so I was always vocal. And even like in the house with my parents, like, you know, Dominican parents at parties, the kids are in the room playing and then the adults are in the living room talking politics and all that shit. And like, you really was talking politics. And I really would be listening. Like I'd be playing, but I would be listening. And sometimes I'd sit around the adults for a really long time. And then when they noticed I was there for too and they go, yeah, the pal cual, or whatever. Mm-hmm. But like, I was soaking in all of this information from a young age, and so it mattered to me. But I didn't know what social justice or I didn't know what it was called. I just knew that I saw a problem, and I thought we needed to fix it because that's the way the world worked. Um, and so that fire for justice and advocacy has never left. But I realized the, the older I got, and the more I learned about politicians mm-hmm. and even lawyers, because then I thought I'd maybe be a lawyer. Um, the more I realized is that I can't be paid to be a liar like I can't have a job where it's almost my job to have to like fix my words in a way to fool people or to convince people if it didn't feel honest um but somebody told me hey you know I think you're an actor Mm. and I was like am I an actor like I was always very animated and then you know and it's kind of fucked up but they were like yeah and you're you're so articulate and you're so and they would do that whole thing and back then I didn't understand how they were like complimenting me but at the same time sort of playing me Mm -hmm. um but you know I was like great and so um I would write a lot of poetry and it'd be all my feelings that nobody would hear when I'd be like oh this is wrong in the world but then I'd write it um and I'd perform poetry and they're like yeah that right there like you're an actor you're a performer you have to go for this applied to LaGuardia High School performing arts got in um and I was like the first person in like decades from my school in the Bronx that had ever gotten into that school for drama which was really exciting to me but also I was like damn why like why (laughs) is it the case that if there's been so many years that a student got into drama in this New York City public school and then even that experience as as happy as I was I was just sort of like wow this is fucked up like it's special and I'm glad it's special but it shouldn't feel this special for me to be making it to this step and so went to LaGuardia did acting fucking like my whole perspective of the world changed. I went from being this nerdy, like, say no to drugs yeah, yeah. sort of kid to this <laughs> hippie. Fast right. Fast, it's a fast we dad. Need like, to it's, explore right, character. Right. I'd be like, this is all character research. <laughs> so, like, it, and it was a big flip, but it was also a big flip in the sense that um, culturally, like, growing up, the, my nicknames were Hillary Clinton, white girl. Like, this is what they used to call me in the Bronx, right? So then I get to LaGuardia, and they're like, 
oh, so you go to sleep at gun sh- to gunshots <laughs> sounds? Like, that's your lullaby? Like, and I'm like, wait, what? Like, mm-hmm. why do you think, like, trying to paint my life as this, like, you know, like, menace to society sort of picture that mm-hmm. wasn't real? And I'm like, I mean, like, there are drugs in my neighborhood. There are things that are going on. But this, like, weird caricature mm-hmm. that you have of the type of girl I am because I'm from the Bronx really bothered me. So it was like I was too white for my people, but I was too hood mm-hmm. Latin for white people. And so I had this whole identity crisis of, like... When did you find a balance of that where you said, fuck that, I'm just going to be me. And I'm like, college. yeah, I'll be white sometimes. Yeah, I'll be ghetto at times. Yeah. yeah, I'll be me at times. Yeah, it really college, I think, solidified it because even though I was trying my best to just be that person it wasn't until college and I learned the term Afro Latino mm. that I was like wait what like and and it just brought a whole other part that actually just justified for me because I think my um separation from my hoodness was the association to blackness mm. and I think that in Latinx cultures we have a really bad habit of like shaming our black side and uplifting our mm. colonized side and so I always thought the more I associated with the blackness aka the hood shit like that that meant that I wasn't being successful or that I wasn't professional and I just had to learn but I love that shit and there's shit about black culture that I was just like but I identify so much how wow. could I identify if that's not who I am and so finally I found the language to be able to tell even people in my family who didn't understand that we were black no fuck you guys like Mm -hmm. that is my culture it is i'm not african-american but i did grow up in an america with african-americans and i am a black woman so like my experience Mm -hmm. and my proximity to that world was so close it's like yes that is also my culture yeah and so and being able to solidify myself in that and you know learning a lot from civil rights movements and in college i took like civil rights class this and black panther that like i really dug into the studies um and then that's when i even learned that there were latinx movements right and like chicano movements and stuff like that but being from dominican republic we don't even though people group us as just all latinos like the chicano movement doesn't necessarily serve my Afro-Dominican lens, right? And the things that I need uh, done for me. In many cases, it does, but in the ways that I can individually point to Dominican advocates and, like, be able to speak to Dominican movements was, mm-hmm. like, non-existent for me. But it then gave me the fire to be like, well, I have to be the first Dominican of a lot of things. Like, I need to be on this forefront. And lo and behold, you get on the road and you realize you're not the first. And there are people who've mm-hmm. done certain things before, but... The world just didn't bother to tell you their names, right? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until you go on this journey that you start to discover who these people are. And so I think leaning into my own identity allowed for me to let go of the notion of whatever white identity wanted me to be or was challenging me to be or was trying to, like, box me in as. Mm -hmm. I didn't care anymore because I had. What helped you and what helped you to discover your name and who you are? Because it seems like early on... You know poetry and create this creative side to you was this spark plug this light yeah. that was a part of you that was also revealing certain layers of yourself so how did you start uncovering your name <sighs> wow i mean honestly a lot of teen <laughs> angst when it <laughs> had to happen before i even began to remotely discover and I, and i would even argue not to sound corny like i'm still discovering who i am and like what what who the woman I want to be mm-hmm. in the world, right? Like when I die, what what can people say that about me and what I left behind? And I feel like that's a lot of the ways in which I measure who I am. But at the same time, the deeper work of trying to understand like, but what do I like? What am I outside of the work I do? I think because I've always been so passionate about things, mm-hmm. it's always given me an excuse to not have to think about myself and reflect on myself as a mm-hmm. human. And I can just attach my identity to the things that I do. So I think mm-hmm. as an adult, a lot of the work that I'm doing is like, okay, like strip all of that fancy po- political talk, blah, blah, blah. Who are you? Like, what do you like on a basic day? And being very aware of myself in moments of like, oh, I'm in this room. Do I want to be in this room in this moment? But do I, or am I just here because I feel mm. I have to be? Like, what do I, Julissa, want in mm. the world? So I don't know. What did you learn about yourself in those moments of when you was, because you said no one really knew what was going on, but I did because I would write it in my poetry. So if you mind sharing, what were some things that you was going through or learning about yourself when you were right or whenever you're right now like what are you yeah. what are you grasping on and connecting to i think the first language that i that i realized i knew that other people in 
other worlds didn't was poverty, right? The language of poverty and what that means. So that um, if somebody, you know, the young men around me who would threaten someone to take from them, like rather than hearing the threat of what they wanted to take, I would hear, I don't have enough food at home to eat. Like, you know, or if, you know, the way mom would be like, you know, we don't, oh, what do you mean you want that $3 for that program? We don't got those $3. Like Dave Chappelle says, mm-hmm. like, special. Like, I ain't got the, th- the $3, right? And like understanding like, you know, parent being upset because they want to give me an opportunity, but just cannot afford to at the moment. Like my brain always computed things to the subtext mm-hmm. and never to the surface level. And that's how I would write. So even though like, like I would, I could write poetry, I would write poetry like from the perspective of like a gang member. I wasn't in no gang. Like I wasn't on the block with these guys, but I was, you know, in school I'd see it and I'd really almost like suck the subtext out of it. And it would, I would be emotionally affected by it. Doing exactly what you used to do when you was young in the sala, hearing everybody observing, soaking out there. So you carry that onto your environment as well. Yeah. And so that's how, and like, those were the types of things I, I was writing and, it would always like alarm my parents because they're like, Pero tú tienes comida en la casa, muchacho, ¿qué tú estás hablando? Pero tú no estás en ganga, pero tú no. Like, they'd read my shit and they're like, This is not you, right? And, and I'd be like, No, but this is, this is us. Like, this is our community. And so, like, if they can't articulate that, if they can't speak their translation, I want to translate that. And I want everybody to hear the translation because that's what they need to understand. So if a principal is dealing with the student, the student's like, oh, fuck you, fuck a principal. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. I need the principal to understand that that person is going through a very difficult time because their mother is sick and they're, you know, the eldest kid in the house. So they're taking, they're basically raising their siblings. I want my principal to understand that. I don't want him to get in trouble just for saying fuck you. And like, I still have that passion in the world. So you can't imagine how I feel right now living in a Trump America. Like Bro. every day, all the shit that I see, it's like, if I let myself, I could be sad every day. It's, 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 it's funny because, um, I see that how you took your social activism and your, 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 your passion for having a voice and speaking up for others and changing things, um, how you took that and put it into your art. Yeah. And where you said, well, I'm not going to be part of that game where I'm going to be paid to lie. I'm going to be part of my own game and create art that's going to change lives. Yeah. And hopefully that will seep in and make certain changes to that. Yeah. Um, When did you start uh, really attacking that and it's like now I want to take these stories and bring it to life I was really fortunate to have a mentor named Lucy Thurber who's a playwright and she also writes for TV shows on like Showtime she's the mm-hmm. shit love that woman to death um, who was the person to tell me hey you're a playwright the same way I had somebody tell me I was an actor I had somebody say hey like and she had seen a lot of my spoken word stuff and she was like, hey, but do you know you're a playwright? Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, I, I, I don't know that. Um, and so, you know, I, she encouraged me to start writing plays. I wrote my first play, Daniel, which uh, had its first, like, workshopping at Intar Theater, which was so special because mm-hmm. I was in the Latinx space. You know, the play was about a Dominican grandma in the Heights who was raising her two grandsons. But we see the history of how their parents used to be in the drug gra- game and all that stuff and seeing how they have to, like, pick and choose their paths, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, that to me, like, speaking that story and, like, sharing that story, even in Latinx spaces and seeing the lack of Dominican stories I was like holy shit like people really really don't see the niche of my story so I moved away from just talking about like general like Bronx stuff into like specific groups of people and understanding why it's important to focus in Mm -hmm. on certain moments because I like to write big world like Mm -hmm. galaxies of things but like understanding the importance of narrowing stories down then um, Lucy was able to plug me into different projects in which I was able to take my ability to write into like policy rooms. So we worked with a prison um, upstate in New York with a production company called Mighty Shiro Productions. And uh, we did a production of the vagina monologues in the space with women who were formerly incarcerated at that prison to perform it back to women who were still currently incarcerated at that prison. And it was a phenomenal like one of the most empowering projects I had ever done in my life. And and it was, and it really taught me, first of all, like, wow, it you don't have to like write a new story from scratch to make impact for art. You can take things that exist and just shake up and disrupt the space 
to bring the art in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the women were like wooing and like going crazy and the guards were trying to calm them down. And like, Mm -hmm. we were like, no, it's fine. Like, let them get excited. Like, this is what we're here for. And being able to give that moment to those women, which was, was so special. And then it led to us meeting with policymakers in Brooklyn. Um, Hold on, I just want to touch on that real quick because it's this beautiful moment when you're sharing that the the, the women that have been incarcerated there, they're they're celebrating and having fun. And that moment, I just saw you giving them freedom Mm. in a place where they didn't have that anymore. Yeah, yeah. And here's a space now where they can explore and be themselves and relate and most importantly, feel that freedom that you have that when you walk out of that place. Right. Which right. Was like, it was like, I mean, like, we were all in tears by yeah. the end of it. Like, there was no way that there was not a dry eye in the house because just like even like if you know women in prison, like even access to feminine hygiene products is like, and you know, very difficult. And some mm-hmm. women can't afford it from commissary or the prisons aren't stocked enough to like provide any. Mm-hmm. And so um, and then if you need to go to the doctor, you have to like set up the reason why you need to see the OBGYN to get pads or tampons. It's like this crazy complicated process. So like there, there's a lot of period references in yeah. vagina models, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, but like even those moments where it's just like, wow, they felt like a breath of fresh air of validation to some of the things that they go through day to day that people don't care to uh, listen to because they're criminals and you know nobody gives a fuck about them and it, it, it was just so po- empowering so that project same production company led to us uh, working with the Brooklyn DA um, and we interviewed a different group of women who had been formerly incarcerated not all from the same prison but um, you know from different prisons and I had the honor of interviewing a woman who's 76 years old um, and she almost did a full life sentence for a crime she did not commit oh, wow Yes, um, that her uh, girlfriend had actually committed, but they both went down for it. And part of the reason she went down for it was because uh, she she identifies as a lesbian and is sort of like masculine presenting. Um, and at the time, and she's Boricua, she's a beautiful woman, um, but just like... At the time, the police officers and her being a Boricua woman and even in the Boricua community, lesbians weren't as accepted. So it was Mm -hmm. almost like she was like challenged, like, oh, you want to be a man? Oh, you Mm -hmm. want to be a man? And so like that sort of heat with the police got her in the position where she was sort of sentenced even without actually having committed a crime and just talking about just her whole life story. And so I actually wrote a 10 minute scene that was meant to be a gift to her that highlighted her experience. Um, and it was performed, uh, Laura Gomez, who's actually on Orange is the New Black. Um, and she was in the piece as well, which was amazing, right? And so it came full circle. It was like, you know, a story of a woman who was in prison in a setting for prison advocacy with a woman who's playing a prisoner currently in the yeah. show. It was just like all the layers. Um, and the piece was, I mean, she cried so hard that I just, I was just so humbled and she was like, wow, I never, I never looked at it that way. So I, all I did was, was take her words and just like try to create a story and I added some poetry to it. Um, but she was just like, wow, that she had never had a moment to reflect on her life in the way that it was illustrated, both in the ways it was painful and beautiful. And so I was like, the projects like that are what tell me like, I want to be a writer and all that stuff. But if I never make a dime off of it and I can continue making art that is going to impact people and that all these policymakers who are like, you know, real mug face and try to act like they don't care about inmates have are crying in this fucking theater because they cannot hide from the truth of human emotion. Um, and that's my sort of job in the world. It's just to be like, this is where we are. We're on different sides on the issue, but like, what is the real human emotion here? And aren't we human at the end of the day? It's, it's funny because the work that you do, um, and the impact that you make, it's, it's going to sound cliche, but it's so true because you feel it. The impact that you make, it's worth more than money because yeah. money, the money is not going to make you feel those tears, make you see the changes that you made in those people's lives through your word and through their story. So you have made an impact that that money can't buy, Right. you know, and you will continue to. I want to know the process between, and is it similar or different, the process of you writing about stuff that you've been through within and the process of taking somebody else's story. Is it is it a different process or are they very similar? Can you take us yeah. down that road when you're going to write for yourself and then write for somebody else? So I love to talk a lot and to storytell a lot. 
my least favorite thing to do is talk or stories tell about myself. Really? So, like, in the, even in, like, my talking during this interview, if you listen back, you'll see, like, I'm taking your questions, but I'm taking you through a back yeah. road yeah, yeah, yeah. to avoid just, like, directly going to the mm-hmm. meat and the heart. I see that. Yeah. No, it's the back. No, no. It's the person I always tell the direct I was going to say, so you are, sir, are a really great podcaster. <laughs> I'm going to call it out. Um, <laughs> right. So, but, but um, I hate writing about myself, and okay. I hate writing about my own personal experiences only because, uh, like I said, a lot of my identity, I'm still on that road of, like, who am I? And I feel like when I write about my own personal things, if they're not things that I have like overcome to a degree, Mm. then the writing isn't serving an audience. It's self-serving. And so the art doesn't land the same, right? Okay. So what is it? What is it? If you can want to share, what is so hard for you to face to write about yourself? Not to, not to present, not to like, I'm going to take this and I'm going to give it to this person, that person, and you can perform it. Because I know right. that can feel so, like, even weird now. Like, that person's living through my words. Right, right. What is so hard for you to write for yourself and, I guess, to face? Because I know for me, it is, it is one is tough. It, it, it feels like, you, you, of course, naked. It's, uh, but there's also a beauty for me in the end of that road of, like, okay, I finally get off my chest. Right. So I would like to know... You know, from artist to artist, writer, writer, human, human. What is in your way? Or what is so tough for you? To like, oh, when I'm attempted or whatever, oh, I don't want to do it. I think I am not fully over the line of not caring what people think. Mm. And I think that that is, uh, as an artist, like once you get to sort, like sort of overcome that, yeah. it's like you you hit super saiyan level, like right, right. you know what I mean? Because then you nothing limits your art in that way. And then there's other things, maybe money in terms of production and other mm-hmm. other elements. For me, like, but why do you care? Because you're not presenting to that to the world. It's going to be about you. Why do you care to not? really go through to write it because then you i have to face it either way you know what i mean like i'm still facing the thing Mm -hmm. that i probably have not made a decision about what i feel because i'm more i'm still more worried about what other people think even if people aren't even looking or asking right you know we're gonna read it like if i write it down um but low-key facebook statuses sometimes Mm -hmm. you sit (laughs) We really want to get at it. Yeah. We really want to decode me. Uh, Facebook statuses sometimes have that, and I've stopped that more so because I, I think less people are on Facebook these days. But right. um, on Bronche, every once in a while, um, I throw out these poetry pieces. And yeah. this past April for Poetry Month, I did write a poem a day. Um, and those are all related to feelings that were happening in the moment mm-hmm. on those days. And that was really an attempt for me mm-hmm. to start breaking away from that and then like there was a, I mean I went through something really terrible uh, last year uh, mm-hmm. last August and I haven't actually quite addressed it but it was right. my attempt to start to not in every single piece but in several of the pieces try to deconstruct my emotion <clears throat> artistically because even privately like right. getting that on paper was so hard for me and it was the first time that I was like challenged beyond like caring what people think it was more like I couldn't even put words together right no, so, I, I, yeah. I can relate one million percent with you. You know, me working on this new show, it's it's very deeper and darker and also there's a light and it's brighter. You know, it's very, very tough and I at times I delayed the process of it because I don't want to face certain things. Right. But what I wanna ask you is like when you see when you take other people's words and you see the effect that it brought to other other people you know, from the tears, from the joy. It's very satisfying for you, right? When right. You see yeah. that. Yeah. Don't you think that the effect <laughs> that you have I with see. other people's words and your words can do the same for you in your life? Because I want you to realize that you do have a beautiful gift. Because before you even affected your life, you touched many others already. So if you were to die tomorrow, knock on wood, I'm not going to want that, right? There will be people saying, I remember she took my words and did this. I yeah. remember when she did this play and I talked about this. I, I remember when she did all this stuff and it helped me. And I think you owe it to yourself to help you with your words. Because it shows 
how powerful you are, how gifted you are. And it does suck to watch, to write about yourself. It really does. Uh, but there's a beauty and there's a beautiful light in the end where it's um, like a triumph. Yeah. Because you've seen it. You've seen the results of what it is to go through the fire and come out. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And then like... To answer your your first first question mm. was actually like around process mm. and, and then I knew what the difference was. Um, so I mean, the process for me really what's different about like taking someone else's words versus my words is um, you know that moment of that, like that listening moment. First of all, it's so fun yeah. um, to really allow someone, and I love to ask questions, which is why I also have my own podcast, mm-hmm. right? We're get so real like back you into know, that. and like I and the idea of being able to really give. The, the way people feel, especially folks who don't often get to talk about themselves or aren't asked what they think or how they feel about things, when you allow them to start going, the, the details that they provide that they don't even realize are like the most gorgeous like strokes of color that I then get to use in the story later on. It's just so wonderful. Um, and then it's fun because it's like somebody's giving me a palette. You know what I mean? And so I'm able to play around with that palette. In my mind, like that is the easiest way for me. You want me to write something? Give me a prompt. Give me a story or tell me, you know, you want me to interpret something? I'll write that super fast. Again, starting from scratch, having to self-reflect that like storytelling portion on my own. It's like talking to myself, right? Mm. And like going deep into myself and really trying to understand how I want to articulate it so that it's like first I have to word vomit and do it in the way that it is selfish. And then I have to go back and be like, all right, so how am I shaping the story? So that it also is helping the audience. Like if I'm writing about women who've been raped, right? Mm. Like if I have to go into my own story and come out of that, right? Like I can write my experience, but then is that, worded in a way that is also going to help and heal others like and and then that's the the work right that's the playwright brain that's where you it's a job and not just anybody can do it Mm -hmm. and you go back and you look at the layout and you organize this this way and you're like oh well maybe if this is too angry at the top it'll turn off the audience and then you get technical and then you present out and then that technical process though is the part though where i tend to strip a lot of the personal stuff not even not but just because if I haven't addressed it yet, like I said, then it, it's more therapeutic for me and it's not going to serve the story. Yeah. And then, but then by the end of it, then I write a product that is true from my heart, but is more for the audience and it's not for me anymore. Mm. I think you have there like a, a critic in your process that's not needed that every artist has. <laughs> that every artist has. That every artist has. <laughs> we tend sometimes to worry about so much about what people are going to think about, what people are going to feel about it. And... It's, I feel it's not needed because at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is what you think of it. Right. And when you start creating for other people, then the project becomes for everybody else and not for you. Right. And where we tend, where we need to realize, and even myself, is that when we write without that critic, it's, go, it's, it's still going to be for us, but when we release it, it's still going to hit people entirely different. Right. Like and, they, and at the end of the day, they're still gonna have their own opinion about it, but it's it's touching them different because it's and it's gonna you're gonna be content with it because you wrote it with the intentions for you, not right. for you guys. Right. Knowing that with my pure intentions for me, and it hit you guys totally different. Like it actually came from you. Man, it hits different. Yeah. Because it might, that wasn't my intention to write for you guys. And do you have this thing though? And I'm not going to your way. Right. Right. <laughs> but do you have this? Because here's where I like struggle or where my brain naturally does this. I have this thing where because, yes, I'm a writer. I'm also an actor. But I also produce things. Mm-hmm. I also direct things. And sometimes when I'm creating a piece, all of those aspects of my brain are fighting at the mm-hmm. same time. Yeah. So as I'm being just the writer, you know, just writing my cute right. thing, I have a producer that's like, bitch, a 12-person cast? nobody's producing that okay do i want to go back and like right. produce that and you know and so on and so forth and so i struggle with that sometimes do you find that yes to you? i think that's i i think you got to know when to use those hats when yeah. those hats are being fueled by you know i want to say like ego and pride but when those hats are being fueled by that that, that just want to have a voice for this moment like hey i know you didn't ask for me but I, i'm the producer now it's and i see like this it's like, wait a minute, what's like the, here's, the, yeah, here's the director now. It's like, I actually think that will actually work, you know, but do we have the budget for it? I think you got to know when and how yeah. to use it. So, for instance, um, if you're going to be the writer, just be the writer. And yeah. maybe the next day, look at it as a, as a producer, yep. right? I think one of the best advice that I got, one of the best advice that I got when I was doing these one-man shows was 
Always think cost effective. Don't try to make these stories, this production so big that you right. can't travel with it. Right. You know, that you need all these things to make it, uh, to make it happen. Right. So when I'm writing something, I keep that in mind as a producer. Right. Keep it simple. Um, a lot of these theaters have projectors. If you're gonna have a projector, that's not right. a problem. But it, right. it can you can travel with it. It's right. cost effective. Right. Um, the director side of me comes in probably later on when now where I feel like I have a script and now I can start living these characters where mm-hmm. I can be like, oh, I should do it this way, whatever. And then with my other director, Guru Lightman, she gives me the direction as well. So I think it's all a matter of when and how to use these hats. Yeah. You know, and don't don't let these uh, don't let the producer, the director come into the writer because they have that own hat for a reason. Right. You know, <clears throat> and, and also it, it kind of like limit yourself, right? It's because su- it's super limiting. And it's, and, and it's annoying because you're writing this great piece. Let's say it's a 10 person cast. You have writing this great piece, but now the producer comes in early and kind of ruins where this play is going. Yeah. Yep. You know, yep. who's to say that whatever you write. The producer can't come later on. It's like, all right, do I really need 10 characters now? Maybe I could right. do seven. Maybe I could do six. Right. So let them come later on. Yeah. Not, not in the early stage of the process. Yeah. It's still forming. You know, that's like us. It's still a baby. So that's like us going inside Picking of Picking their womb. college. Yeah, no. Yeah, right, exactly. Before. Exactly. That's us going in the womb. It's like, do you like chicken for dinner? Yeah. You know, I ain't not born yet. Do you have any allergies? Right, right. They're like, yo, I don't even have a foot. Like, yeah. you're asking me other things. Like, you know, do you know what college you're interested? Do yeah. you like comedy? Because there's a movie coming out next week. I want you to hear it. I know you can see it, but yeah. I want you to hear it, hear it in the womb. Right? So it's kind of like, no, let, let that cook and let right. that... Uh, marinate and become what it needs to become yeah that's my advice on that there it is there you go <laughs> um sure. what what are the different experiences you get from performing pieces and then um seeing it live mm-hmm. like from the is there a, a difference to it is there a, a big high because yeah, i know okay. from performing you're like yeah this is crazy yeah. i can't go to sleep now yeah so like what is the experience for you like <laughs> listening? I'm literally, I'm literally like <laughs> the whole time, <laughs> and people are laughing. It, okay. People laugh, and I'm like, ha 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 ha. Okay, they like like it is so fucking terrible. I feel bad for people who sit next to me. I often when I have things, I don't sit next to family, and I think mm-hmm. they think I'm just like trying to be all I'm whatever. Saying, I'm but I'm like, no, no, I don't need you to have to deal with me while I'm watching <laughs> this. Just enjoy the show. Mm-hmm. And let me freak out in the back. So that's my watching experience. But like performing, when I'm on that stage, there's nothing like being on a stage. And as much as I've really leaned into my writer brain more so than my acting, like acting is my first love. Mm. It just is. And it always will be. And low key, like as much as I write, I'm always secretly hoping that somebody will cast me in something. Mm-hmm. Like, I love when people ask me to just come read for them, even if it's not just a table read. Like, I love acting. That's mm-hmm. what I do. It's what makes me feel good. It's therapy, in a sense. Mm-hmm. And, and just in the sense that my body gets to move and I get to sound and do things that are out of my element. And it's almost like doing an exercise. Mm-hmm. Some people get the high from going to the gym. I get the high from being on stage. Like why I don't said. you cast yourself? You wrote so many I things. I write like, so what? many things. Like, why? I okay, know. Even if it's not even about, like, your right, own my own stuff. Like, right, why right. is it, like, I don't think I can do this. And Honestly, you can hire yourself. I've done it before. Okay. So I've done it, um, and, it and it does work. I okay. have to make, I just have to do it again. Like, I gotcha. just have not, in the past few years, written something for me again. And outside of, like, spoken word things, because I'm, like, performing at a certain show, or people ask me, usually people ask me to do a spoken word piece, and I like to write new pieces for them because I don't make the time to write stuff just because mm-hmm. anymore. Um, but I need to do that. That's actually on my list of things to do awesome. is like to try to get back out there and like, yeah, because I can audition like that. I mean, it's not like I'm auditioning and failing. I'm not even auditioning at right, this point, right. right? So I need to start auditioning auditioning again so that I can really be in rooms. And even auditioning can be fun, you yeah. know? And if I'm really going into it, not with the intent that this, hopefully I get this gig so I can pay right, my right. bills, then like even less, right? Like even right. less stakes and then maybe Maybe I'll get something and maybe I don't. So is your family creative? Like and like yeah. do they have those things in their yeah, blood? Do they support you? What do they think about you and all these different hats? I mean, like, <laughs> I think they still secretly think I'm crazy because yeah. but they're only okay because I have a day job that pays the bills. So they're like, Oh, okay, she can do all that crazy shit right. off hours, yeah. but she has a job. If I didn't have a job, I would say that they would they're all supportive. Mm-hmm. Um, first of all. And I think what I learned eventually I thought they were only supportive because they felt they should because they're family. 
I, my family actually thinks I'm talented. So like, they're, <laughs> so they're, so they're like, oh no, like we think you're good at this thing. Mm-hmm. So like now, like and when you're a kid, of course it's like, of oh, your parents always love you. Can't you can come home with shitty art and they're still yeah. gonna put it on the fridge, right? But now that I'm an adult and they're like, oh well, we do think that there's a way that you can make money off of this thing because I consume content too, and like I think that person is super whack, and look where they're at, and. Mm-hmm. Look at you, like, yeah. you know, but you're not there. And so for my family, they're supportive. But now it's kind of annoying because before when they didn't get it, they weren't on my ass. But now that they understand and now they're holding me yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the same way that my mom was hoping I'd be a lawyer. Now she's like, pero escribe algo. Pero la gente vive poniendo cosas en YouTube. Pon otra cosa en YouTube. Ponte con Juan. Now, blah, now blah, blah, blah. Agents and right, now they're my agents and managers. And like, oh, mira, esta en Univision. Pero esa muchacha, mira, ella morena también because... For a while, their thing with me, I'd always be like, oh, well, I'm too black for that thing. And they'd be like, yeah, you're right. They don't have black people here. But now yeah. they're like, they want black people everywhere. So what are you yeah. doing? Like, <laughs> get going. I'm, I'm at that phase now. You probably can agree. Like, I'm in my, I'm 31, right? So my mom, when I started doing it and telling my mom this is what I'm doing, I was like maybe like tw- in my 20s and stuff like that. I'm at that age now where people ask me what I'm doing, what's the next show. And they're like, oh, you still doing that? <laughs> so it's, I know like, that feeling. Yeah, yeah. I like I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to give it a three year thing yeah. and like nothing. Yeah. And I'm like, it's weird because like I was talking to one of my uh, high school teachers, and he's in his fifties or his forties, and he's still artistic. He's still doing it. And I told him, I was like, yo, um, you don't know like how much your story means to me because I told him like where I'm at. He's like, yeah, I still have friends that. Look at me like, yeah, I have my day job and I do what I love, but I have people that still look at me like, oh, you're still doing that. that that's cute. Like, yep. And, you know, when are you going to give it up? When, and he's like, I'm going to give this up, what I love, to be in your position, to right. like give up on everything and dreams. And right. I told him that's inspiring and to never give that up. He's yeah. like, you don't got to tell me that. Yep. Like, he just looked at me like, I don't even need this conversation. I literally <laughs> tell my mom, so I tell my mom, I'm like, you see how you have church mm-hmm. and you love organizing shit for church and that's your, mm-hmm. you know, playground. The arts is my playground. If mm-hmm. on the weekends I want to link up with Juan and make a dumbass video about something, mm-hmm. like that is my church. That is where I am able to really echo and speak into the universe my thoughts and feelings and contributions mm-hmm. as an artist. Like Speaking of Juan, this is a great segue. You guys, uh, what is that relationship? Because um, I know I just we're married. <laughs> <laughs> well, congrats. Um, you guys look fabulous together. Um, no, because I seen you guys creating. There was a viral video you guys did yes, together. Yes, we did. So, what is that relationship for, yeah. besides marriage? Like that, how you guys connected to create content. And then what led to the podcast that you guys want to do? Yeah, so just just for people who don't know us, so I'm not actually married. To, to, <laughs> and I just keep laughing because just the image of how much that would not work yeah. is hilarious. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, Skittles and I met each other in high school. Mm-hmm. So we both went to LaGuardia Performing Arts. He was also from the Bronx. Um, I actually, quick aside, met him on Sconex for anybody who mm. remembers that. Um, and before, before we started school, and the reason I friended him was because on his profile he had said that he was gay mm. and at the time for whatever reason I thought or assumed I had not met a gay man before mm. and I was so pr- and I wrote to him saying wow you're from the Bronx and gay and you're out I'm so proud of you that is such a hard thing to do I have a campaign right? <laughs> right? Like, literally, like, like literally something like but I, he was like um like thanks like hi and I'm like hi like and I just thought he was brave and really that's mm. the story that like that's where how I met Juan is that I thought he was an incredibly brave person and he mm-hmm. is in fact an incredibly brave person and so um, you know we became friends and you know blah 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 adventures along the way we get to college right and he goes to Westminster Choir College I stay in New York and I go to Brooklyn mm-hmm. College um, and you know the shit girl say video the first real mm-hmm. original one was out um, and we were on break at the time and I was like hmm, I see shit girls say, I see a shit black girl say, and then I Google, or I YouTube shit Spanish girls say, or, and I, you, I Googled shit Hispanic girls say, and I was like, hmm, shit Latin girls say? And nothing came up. And I was like, oh shit, nobody's made one yet. And then I hit Juan up, and I'm like, bro, you're in town. I think you would be perfect 
for a shit girl say video and I want to do shit Spanish girl say. I was like, I don't want to do Dominican, Puerto Rican. I don't want to do New York. And I'm going to say Spanish because people in New York call us Spanish. I grew up in the Bronx and all the people in the black community be like, oh, you're Spanish. They wouldn't mm. specify, even though I know Spanish is a language and not a race, yeah. which we got a lot of shit for on YouTube. If you read the comments, people are like, this is not people Spanish. This is not from Spain. And I'm like, I know it's a local niche it's a local thing. It's not a... Anyway, so we did it. Um, and I was like, I have a friend. He's like, oh, I don't have my equipment. I was like, great. I have a friend with a camera, David Zhang, who's also an incredible playwright from the Bronx. So I'm like, all right, David Zhang got a camera. And he's like, well, I have a friend who can like be the camera person and like help us direct and shit. And that's Melanie Gonzalez um, of Melanie Gonzalez Art, who's also an incredible person and you guys should look up. Um, and we, the four of us came together and had a 10 hour shoot. Um, and so that little ass video took us no, 10 no. hours and one day to do. <laughs> And we just did it and like, you know, I had written like a, a light script um, and then even throughout the day we were coming up with phrases and we're like, oh, I'll put that mm. in and I'll put that in. And we, this just like beautiful video came together. And honestly, like after I watched the first draft, I was like, damn, it's not as funny as I thought, but mm. like, fuck it, I had mad fun. Exactly. We put it up, we wake up, it's two days later and Juan's like, holy shit, VH1 best week ever just highlighted our video. That's hilarious. I was like... <laughs> What? You're bugging, and then BuzzFeed released an article, and then like this myth again, and then all these other like platforms, and then the views just started counting and counting up, and the next thing you know, it was viral, and we, when I tell you, we had no idea and had zero intentions on this becoming viral. Right. I just wanted my friends to laugh at my video right. of the version of this thing. In the same way that like people, you know, do little games and quizzes and stuff that are popular in whatever day, that's just what was popular that week and I decided I wanted to participate in yeah. it and I pulled my people together and now it's like, <laughs> I don't it's, even know what to call it no, anymore. It's, it's, uh, it's <laughs> like, part of history now. Yeah. It's part of like the legendary viral video. And I've heard that. And first, it took me a really long time to actually let that register. When we were re recording um, with Curly out in LA, mm. Curly from BuzzFeed. Um, so we were talking to Curly and Curly's like, yeah, because your video was, I remember it when I was in school, like we were watching that video and we were quoting that. And mm -hmm. we have like other content creators who are way bigger than all of us now who are like, girl, are you kidding me? Like that shit was like, since I was my muse, like mm -hmm. that, the idea that what we created just from, which goes to show you when you overthink it sometimes is when you really fuck it up. We just went in there to have fun and we yep. walked away with something that inspired a lot of people's favorite people today so that that message just rings through for your whole entire riot process yeah. again like just have fun just with have it. fun with it <laughs> and don't be that critic you know yeah. and just do it yeah and look where it went yeah like, at the perfect example when you do things for yourself everything will follow through yeah absolutely and then like you asked about it leading yeah, to ladies who grow the, 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 the podcast so, you know, after, after She's Spanish Girl Says Buzz, like, we got nominated for Telemundo Award. We didn't win. We lost to a dog that was dancing merengue, which is, like, all good, but I still feel some type of way that I lost to a dog. Like, I would have... Oh, no, I'm lying. A girl singing with her dad, but a dog dancing merengue also was, like, a runner-up to us. Um, anyway, so it was a wonderful experience, but we had a sort of dead period. So we were, like, at, then afterwards, we were, like, junior, seniors in college, so we were really focused on just getting the fuck out of school and we had our side jobs and I had a really, you know, I was infatuated with my boyfriend. And mm -hmm. so I was like focused on boys instead mm -hmm. of my own shit. Um, and I had to sort of go through a period and then the breakup happened. So then I, that time period mm -hmm. had to pass and we were still creating things, but we weren't really busting out intentional content. Mm -hmm. um, and I had said to Juan, I was like, you know what? I think I know what it is, is that producing videos is too much work and like to have that consistently is too much work and I just like to talk and I just want to talk to people but I don't want to be a documentarian necessarily but I just want to talk to people I think we should do a podcast because we're really fucking funny just when we're talking regular so he was like all right um sure like if you want to do it and so I talked about it for maybe like two years mm. and then finally one day I was like all right I need to get my equipment. I need to get this done. And actually, it was Derek who, Derek of the New York Dose, who was like, all right, like, you know, I, at the time he had the Bodega podcast. And he was like, I got the Bodega podcast. And I just saw that he was doing stuff. And I was helping him along the way. And I was like, I'm putting in time and energy to help him, which I'm still happy to do. But like, I can put that same energy towards what I want to do, which is different than the thing he's doing, right? So we have very different styles. And um, I wanted to 
carve out my name in that way. I wanted to be the interviewer. I went to college for TV and radio. You know what I mean? So it's like, I was like, this is, this is what I went to school for. And it's what I love to do. And it's different than playwriting, which also has, it's redrafting and redrafting and all my art forms that are like, I like takes such a long time. And podcasting was the only thing that just, it is what it is. You record it, you edit it as much as you want or as little as you mm -hmm. want. And then you let the people, you know, listen to it. So, what do you get from this that's different from the other art forms that you do? Like, what does it? It cause it seems like it's feel it's filling a, a need and a void for you yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. That that other the other stuff maybe wasn't given to you consistently, rather than this one. It's podcasting for me. Really, just gives me the immediacy. Of, of being able to speak about things in real time without having to overthink the presentation. But more so, the part that excites me is not talking, it's letting people talk. Mm -hmm. And everything fundamentally that I've done in my art, like I said, has been with the intent to amplify a voice. And this is the easy way, this easiest way to do it. So, you know, the same kids that I used to try to advocate for when I was younger, like, those same people as adults now, I can just put you on the mic. And now you can talk about that thing that no one was ever listening about. And so the, just the moment of the story happening like, is so fulfilling to me because it's coming from them. And I feel like I've created a pathway as mm -hmm. opposed to having to reinterpret and, and it's raw and it's authentic. And I love that. Have you ever thought about creating something that incorporates all of these things that you love to do into like, I don't know, somehow into like one masterpiece <laughs> i mean yes yes in the sense of but not in the sense of like a piece but i my intention with ladies who bronche is actually to create an entire platform and mm. the platform will be ladies who right and bronche is the podcast but there's a lot of other things and a lot of other storytelling mechanisms that i want to utilize um and i just want to keep it on brand so like i said for me like the podcast it, or like my podcast for me is very on brand because it's um what we talk about, the people we bring on, it's all true to who I am and what I'm interested mm -hmm. in. And the same for Skittles. Um, I just want to be able to create a platform where everything I do and touch is moving through the same channel and is looked at as one unified effort mm -hmm. and voice and like artistic social justice platform right. rather than just like people knowing me sprinkled around. What advice would you give uh, others who are like probably at times or and the same challenge that you had, either to write about yourself or to write something, period. Like, what is something that maybe has helped you or other advice you want to give to others to, like, that's in your shoes to get over that hump? You really just have to understand that sometimes you just have to let your words take a shit. Like, you mm. just sometimes... <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you just got to take that shit. Like, it, and it really... And in the ways that the process can be painful and uncomfortable, and sometimes it's super relieving, like right. literally the metaphor of taking yeah, yeah, a shit, yeah. like you know what I mean. It's like very there's sometimes it's, it's yeah. sometimes it's like violently <laughs> ill, and it's nonstop, and you mm. just comes from a place and you can't stop it. Like you just, but you have to like give the first push. Yeah, right? no, absolutely. <laughs> you gotta <laughs> It's a beautiful analogy. I get it. I'm with you. <laughs> That's really the the best way, or the best way that I can phrase that advice. Um, that and then just like push it out, take your shit. Push it out, take your shit, and then like deal with it, right? And then like you deal with your shit. Um, because ripe it and flush it. Ripe it, flush it. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, <clears throat> every project failed or succeeded mm. is a growth, mm. and it's a learning opportunity. Mm. So. And this is a place that I'm at right now. I'm learning to let failed projects be blessings and not disappointments. What is a failed project to you? I'm curious. <sighs> like the definition of one or one that I've been this Like when I hear that, I feel like when I hear that, I think of like uh, I had a reading and only two people came up. Uh, like, right. Like, so what is the definition of like a project that failed in your eyes? To me, a project that fails in my eyes is one that no one who worked with me on ever wants to work on again. Uh, if I ran a train and nobody would ever dare get back on it, something was wrong there. You had a project like that? I'm I, surprised. I haven't. I haven't oh. yet. I haven't yet. No, but... not yet. <laughs> She's like, I'm, looking for one I'm not. I'm not looking for it. But if it comes, I'm. I've been bracing myself gotcha. for it for a long time. And the best thing you can do in that moment is, like, figure out why and get that feedback so that you don't fuck that shit up again. Um, I wanted to ask, too, if, do you find it hard or do you ever see yourself, 
um, not looking back and giving yourself credit for all the amount of shit that you've done? Oh, I don't. I don't even think I've ever begun to like consider credit. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't even consider that. Right, because I'm hearing your story, right, and I'm amazed and I'm inspired by it. Thank and, you. And That's... I'm like, I wonder if she sees it that way. Because sometimes, um, and I could put, I put myself in it too. Artists, we 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 dish out all this work. But I learned, you know, from my spiritual teacher as well, to look back and reflect on how far I came. And I think that's an important trait that an artist should look into and yeah. do. Because, yeah. and it's not about tuning your own horn or ego and pride, but it's like, you're damn right I did this shit. Like, right. you're damn right I took the time to do that and it became a success. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I did some ama- amazing stuff. It's okay to do that. It's, yeah. who else is going to do that? And, and the thing is, Sometimes we wait for the world to give us that that right. credit and that valid. The, the, I'm about to say valid, the, 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 the validation. Validation. Right. And what seems to happen is we get built up by by the world, but not by our own mm-hmm. selves. And when that world crumbles, then who are we really are in the end of the day? Yeah. You know yep. what does our work really mean? You know, and that's why I actually like, man, like you have done a lot, and you are a powerhouse. I wonder if you give yourself credit or reflect and look back like, I wow, I'm pretty amazing and I did that. I, and if you haven't, you should. I, I was going to say I haven't, but like, I think it also comes from a place of like, you so you have your North Star that you're working towards mm-hmm. and like, I'm still, I'm still on my way. But when you look up in those stars in the sky, right, you don't only see one star. You see many stars. Right. And I think you already have... A good amount of stars that Thanks. you should look <laughs> that you should look up and be like, boom, um, wow, I did that, I did that, I did that, I did that. And every now and then there is one big bright star that is like, man, that's super powerful, but it's also being illuminated by the other stars. Yeah. Because if you continue that route and that path, then you will never appreciate that one star you're trying to chase that who's to say that you didn't even reach it already? Right. Because you have all these stars yeah. that you can collect and combine them into one. Yeah. Which is your whole journey that you are leaving and legacy leaving on this thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the other side of that coin, and I'm going to say, and I've been saying this to people a lot lately because I've been trying to call myself out, is just as much as like we as artists have to empower ourselves to see the worth of the work we're doing, friends, family, supporters, people, random people who follow you on social media who, for whatever reason, know your whole life story just Mm because of social media, but you never talk in person. Mm -hmm. Like, these people do not always understand the value of their feedback Mm -hmm. and that they could also say, wow, like, Mm -hmm. that is working. Because I think what's sort of fucked that up for me, I guess, in terms of, like, growing up in a social media generation is that, like, it's almost like, Instead of being able to like do it on my own, I've found it hard to accept that truth that I might be patting myself on the back mm-hmm. for if no one else confirms it. And mm-hmm. so I think it's important, and not in the way to stroke someone's ego, but like people will run to Beyonce's page to congratulate her on something and to like, you know what I mean? But are you also empowering your friends? And again, it's not, again, <coughs> artists, it's not that we should depend on their yeah. opinion whatsoever. No, we should do exactly what you're Absolutely. saying. But then I the think. Same way we're waiting line for a Popeye's chicken. Sandwich. Right, we should do that for our peers. We should be supporting each other, and sometimes if you can't afford the ticket to go to the show or whatever the case is, but like big up their work, reshare their shit. Like yeah. you know what I mean? They're friends who sometimes like before I even get to watch something, I just see that they put something out. I'm gonna repost it because I'm gonna support them anyway, right. and it'll remind me to go back and watch mm-hmm. it later because they need that right. click or they need that you know no, view. I agree. So I think it's also important that we collectively, especially people who in the you know black and brown community like it is so important for us to give each other that support so that we know to keep going we need that inspiration too we need that love too you know (laughs) a a good job of like yo i just checked it out goes a long way for an artist that's our payment yeah like that's we're not looking for but it helps when we have those moments of doubt of doubt of of like should i keep doing this and you know sometimes I, I I battle with them like you know sometimes people just really don't give a fuck like yeah. and it's it's just like I try to cipher it at many different levels and think about it like not to the point where like, I lose sleep over but like I feel like a part of people a part of the people don't give a shit mm-hmm. a part of people just just want to jump on the bandwagon when you are 
have some type of success in the media. Right. So like you could get all this love from people you don't know, but the people that you do know are not giving you that love, but they give you but they give that same love to people that they don't know, like Beyonce, right. Jay Z's, and right. uh, Kendrick Lamar. Everything. Straight like, arguing on a, on a feed, yeah, defending like, these people. Like, Chris, Chris, all I'm asking for is a heart, dude. Right. Like, send yeah. your heart and prayer hands right. on my comment, right, right, on my right. thread. That's all I want. Yeah. And you just sent the whole five paragraph to Beyonce <laughs> right. about how her album is amazing. Right. Can I get a heart? Yeah. Like, right, 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 right. Give me an emoji. Oh, God damn. Smile, bro. Oh, I even put, uh, just give me a K. Right. Like, yeah. Because put a trend somehow. Like, someone right. commented on it. Like, yeah, it's validation. We need it too. Like, that is our fuel to keep going. Like, and I just think it's important that our peers and supporters and followers know that we, those things mean something to us. Because sometimes they maybe just don't think. Yeah. Sometimes people look like, I can look at you and be like, oh, Rick knows he's the shit. Right, right. He don't give a fuck if I write, congrats, bro. Like, yeah, yeah. because I'm just Julissa and he's Rick and he got all these other fly people right. commenting his shit, right? I don't yeah, actually yeah. believe that. I do try to show you no. love. And <laughs> no, no, I know, but I, I do. You know what I mean? But like, it, but some people do have that mentality because they regard us as these strong, regal people people yeah. and they don't realize that even as strong people we that's when you need it even more sometimes I'm not, you're absolutely right i mean I, I mean this is a great conversation because like i people don't from the outside they don't know what it is to be artistic yes there's a beauty to it but there's also another side that to keep that passion alive and the love it, it does take a lot of energy yeah and yes. um and it's to be your own self-motivator and promoter it takes time, right? And it's, it's draining at times, and we are in an industry where jealousy can attack us very easy. Mm -hmm. And I will admit that sometimes I I did feel jealous that how other peers will move on so Same. faster. Same. And yeah. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? You will question yourself. Yep. But it's a natural thing. I'm not wishing hate on them. It's like, exactly, Damn, bro. Like, why can't I be there too? Yeah. But sometimes, what the social media world does to us too like it builds this fantasy to say like well who's to say that what he just got is actually what i really want mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so along this path of being artistic you've got to count your wins in each step no matter how big and how small and even if you send a heart to someone it's like yo keep going that goes a long way and instead of me looking at sometimes at those people like maybe being jealous i learned to like Embrace them and right. learn from them. And right. Say, yo, what are you doing? What is this? I'm going to ask the questions and, you know, can I be a part of that in a way that, like, can we work together? Or if not, it's cool. I'm still doing my own thing. But there's a lot of things in different layers that our artistic person deals with that's natural. Yep. That from the outside person, they don't get it. Yeah. You know, um, and I think it's key yep. that, to continue to be honest and tune yourself up. Absolutely. Um, so, Julissa, we got to know you. And many different layers in this episode. And now we're going to move on to my first segment. And that segment is called Let's Look Inside, which you're probably going to hate. No. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. No, but um, <laughs> and then the first question for Let's Look Inside is what in life is beautiful to you? Hmm. Beautiful question. Um, I think I'm going to say human connection. Because, and obviously there's so many things that go under that, but it's because I equally love watching how humans connect. Mm -hmm. So I love watching an interaction between, you know, homeboy from my block who's cool with the bodega guy because he's been going there for years and the little jokes and the little unspoken bond that they have. That's beautiful mm -hmm. to me. Um, the way you see children, I mean, kids yeah. are like the most they're the biggest example of like just seeing human connection on the most mm -hmm. raw Absolutely. level. Like, you know, seeing a child, right. Be their face light up over something or them say something like really outrageous, like, or too advanced for their age. And like having the moment of the parent, like be like, Oh my goodness, they're just like me. And having mm -hmm. that moment of like overflowing love, that is beautiful to me. Um, you know, just anything when somebody falls on the ground and somebody helps them up, mm -hmm. that's beautiful to me. There's just so Human connection is such a beautiful thing, and I, and I think I try to live my life viewing through that lens because it's the only thing that reminds me why I don't hate the world mm -hmm. every day. That's awesome. The second question is, if we can push the brakes on your life right now, mm -hmm. what is something 
you could pay more attention to in life. Because, you know, every day we hustle and bustle and we tend to forget a lot of things. Or, you know, it's just life. We're busy. So what is something? I'm like trying to answer something that has nothing to do with my art. Mm. Because, like, you know, I'm like, shit, if I have more time, I'm going to make more yeah. art. Um, but outside of making art, I could be... I could be focused on reconnecting with my body because mm. I, you know, I, like I had said before, like, you know, I've, I went through some shit yeah. recently and I think that it threw my body out of whack mm. and like, I don't, I feel awkward in my own skin. And so in moments where I am not like in the middle of something familiar and going, I feel awkward. Mm. Um, and I'm, I've already went through puberty and I'm like, I'm not trying to like fucking go no. through like adult <laughs> puberty right now. Like, but if I am going through that, like what, like, how can I focus on that a little more uh, to grow into myself and to walk with my head up mm. more and to, like, put my shoulders back a bit? Um, even, like, I'm noticing, like, my hand feels like it's getting carpal tunnel. And I'm like, wow, my hands are hurting. And, wow, there are parts of me that hurt. And I don't even give myself the time to realize that they're in pain mm. so that I can slow down. And so I, I think having an awareness with my body and, like, I hate the gym, but maybe... <laughs> stand to go to the gym <laughs> even though I hate it um, and even movement like I used to dance a lot I can't remember the last time I danced like I feel like now when a meninga comes on like I can't last as long as I used to them seven minute tracks yeah, yeah. three minutes in I'm out like you know what I mean I'm like damn like how can I get back into my body um, because I think that is like the core of retaining youth um, and, and I don't I feel old I feel old in a way that's tired and worn out and shouldn't be for my age so, no, it's, yeah, I mean, you have a lot of things to replay on this episode. And, 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 take and actually take notes? Yeah, <laughs> take notes. yeah that's great. You're answering that. Uh, the second segment is called Words from My Spiritual Teacher, Guru Enlightenment. And as mm. you guys know, every time you can go and see in the comment section and go to our website and know what she does. She teaches spirituality. I've been a student for hers for about six years now. She does a lot of free workshops and free sessions. Um, she teaches spirituality, like I said. And in this, se in this segment, I'm going to read um, a part from her book. And it says, am I worthy of love? Yes. Everyone is worthy of love one way or another. It is up to us to find it first within ourselves before we look for it in others. We don't understand that fact and choose not to. What do you think about that? Oof, truth. Um, very, very true. I think that this is the cliche thing that people say, but like you can't like feed someone, you know, from an empty plate or you can't like provide water and from an empty well. Um, so it's, it's really important to take care of yourself and have self-awareness because it's the only thing you can control, like your body, your limbs, like your experience is the only thing you actually have control over. Um, and so how people love you, you know, and like the way those people choose to behave and carry their lives, sometimes like loving people and trying to feed love into people uh, gets you to chase them down a, a rabbit hole in a journey that the universe has set up for them to have to go through that you're not supposed to save them from. And you're busy doing that. And meanwhile, you're not focusing on the things that you need to save yourself from mm -hmm. or you need to like build yourself up from so that, you know, like maybe you're chasing them, but they're going down a really, really big hole and they're going to break all their bones at the bottom of that ditch, right? And they're going to come back and you're not going to have the capability to build them back bone by bone. Mm -hmm. But if you would have gone your own path, you probably would have put yourself in a, in a place of self enrichment and self fulfillment and capability where that broken bone problem is easier to solve because you're in a place of peace for yourself. And so it's not going to take you a lot of time to build them bone by bone. In fact, you might figure out I'm not the one who has to build them, but I know the tools that I can give them so that they can rebuild themselves. I think hearing this and I agree with you. That this resembles your journey. Everything that you shared here today. Is uh, this a secret reading? <laughs> Is this a spiritual reading? Are y'all setting me up? What's going on? Honestly, I think this is like, and you have been touching on it throughout this whole episode from the segments that we talk about, you know, and it's a confirmation for you yeah. to like, you are worthy of love. And the last piece that you need and to fulfill is this love for yourself and yeah. finding that uh, connection that it's okay that I'm going to write about myself. It's okay that I'm going to be myself. It's okay that I'm going to dedicate 
this time to myself, checking your injuries, checking, (laughs) (laughs) you know, doing the medic every 10 minutes, you know, all these things like checking in with yourself. Right. And because every day it seems like you're busy, you're on to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, and you're not the only one that does that. Right. But this is pertaining to you, giving you that confirmation and sign that, yeah, you are worthy of love from your body, from your mind, from your art, from... Every everything and every aspect of your life, because it's the most important love that you need is the love within yourself and the person you looking in the mirror. Yes. Um. So yeah, I think you need to start working on that because you. Before I even said that, you answered it yourself in the other segments. Yeah. You know, in segment number one, question number two, if we push the brakes on your life, and then right. it naturally went into the last segment, guru. Right. And I always tell people, I don't handpick these things. I open up the book and right. whatever I see, I write it. And every time, let's say I did 30 podcasts, 30 out of 30 episodes, they're all pertaining to the person. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> After hearing the journey. So, oh, the spirit. <laughs> <hear you. laughs> oh, spirit. There you go yeah. again. You are now checking out the Win Podcast, where the everyday people are the celebrities. So, so let's, let's get, get to, to know, know them. them.